talking with uh, Dr. Upshur about what a, a different kind of a year it's been. And I think probably it's particularly unusual year for ethicists, because those of us who do um, practice, either you know, practical or clinic, clinical ethics or theoretical ethics, uh, it's rare that, that anybody puts a pager on us. Um, <laughs> and I think that's the definition of optimism, isn't it? An ethicist with a pager? Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, for this case, I think what, what's happened is that the world has um, suddenly bumped up against the, the brick wall uh, without very much clear to offer, without knowing exactly what they want to offer. Um, it seemed like they would need to do what, you know, make whatever choices they made, at least you know, with the highest ethical standards and with the right sorts of, um, uh, of, of considerations with the right sorts of people at the table and all of that stuff. Um, so it's unusual to be an ethicist and a philosopher and be in demand in the way that this seems to have cropped up. It's, it's really quite surprising. Um, uh, sad that it has had to take this kind of an event um, okay, uh, but uh, I guess good at least that these considerations are being brought to the table at this stage. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do with you. Mm -hmm. Group. 
Um, uh, but what I understand was that it's one thing to call together an emergency working group on ethics on Ebola, quite another to find the people in the affected countries um, who are both um, able, willing, sorry, are able, willing, and um, uh, available to speak um, and to join a working group such as this at the right time and in the right sorts of places, and even though it was um, uh, a tele teleconference in the first instance, as I understand it, um, finding the right people to be online when they were so preoccupied with the events of, of um, Ebola and of the horrors and I guess the tragedies going on, um, was difficult to pull people together that way. <coughs> so it's not surprising that they didn't leave it there. Um, sorry, the statement from this one was clearly that uh, uh, Ebola was an emergency, that there was a, a, you know, a, a, an epidemic going on, and that something needed to be done to respond to it. And given that there, there were no um, actual treatments available, uh, this group suggested, recommended that um, <coughs> experimental medications be deployed even without phase one um, evidence of their effectiveness, um, that they be deployed uh, because it was somehow better than nothing else. Um, so as I said, not surprising they didn't want to leave it there because saying that um, experimental medication should be made available to people is not quite the same as figuring out the details and the steps on how that would be done. Um, initially, I guess there were several, well, there's several working groups, I keep looking to Ross because I think this is how it's all working. Um, I was asked to join just in uh, the, the beginning of October. Uh, I was on my way to a meeting in Porto and, asked, and Barcelona and asked, would I stick around and come to this one? So I definitely was an afterthought, and I don't know much about what else went on in the other committees, but there was another one that had commented on the um, vaccine uh, treatment, sorry, experimental vaccine um, availability and how that should roll out, what were some of the ethical considerations with that. And I know that there's also been a group working on the uh, plasma um, availability, so uh, comments, I guess, or a, a statement will be made available fairly soon about the ethics um, of available uh, uh, convalescent plasma serum for treatment of Ebola. When we met in October then, uh, it was quite a, a remarkable phenomenon. We, we rolled in uh, literally was it three days before I was asked if I would give a presentation at this uh, event and I thought, okay, sure, I can pull something like that together and manage to do something quickly. Um, and then uh, we discussed with a, a variety of um, stakeholders, including representatives uh, physically present of, from Guinea um, and representatives from, well, a, represent, a representative from Liberia. So we had managed at least to solve the stakeholder, uh, appropriate stakeholder problem. Um, and then also members from all over the world who had an interest in the clinical trials that would eventually go be, be put into play. Um, and in particular, members from MSF, from Médecins Sans Frontières, who would be responsible for, or who had agreed to at that time, uh, to uh, uh, be the clinical deliverers of these trials, of these medications. Um, and I will speak to that issue because to me that was one of the more poignant um, uh, and difficult ethical issues that was involved in this was um, clinicians being willing to do clinical research even though they're not clinical researchers. Um, and at the end of the meeting, I, oh, sorry, other people who were there were representatives from uh, the United States regulatory agencies, um, from military as well, uh, and then researchers also from all over the world, including members from a consortium that begins at Oxford and kind of spreads out all over the place. And among the working group ourselves, though, were historian, um, uh, anthropologists, uh, several um, ethicists, uh, a legal scholar, I think probably you could say, and then of course people from the WHO themselves who specialize in ethics and ethics research. Um, our statement was quite clear at the end of it, or at least my sense of the, the crux of it, the heart of it is that, well, obviously we need to be doing this kind of research. It should have been being done beforehand. But now that we have the opportunity, we should be doing the research quickly and we should be doing it well. But most importantly, we need to be doing it in an in innovative fashion because the standards of clinical trial research that exist now would not be satisfactory for what was going on on the ground. So that was
was by way of background. I know I don't have too much more time, so I'm going to try to speed through some of the rest of it. Um, but the outline, I want to take a look at issues that are political, clinical, research, and social. And because of the nature of this, this gathered group, and I know so many of you are students, I want to give some fairly high level issues and then at the end um, stop with some questions. Um, so there will be some you know, guidance, I guess, in the midst of it, but mainly it's to open up and ferment the discussion as much as possible. So from the political perspective, the things we were talking this week just now with one of the students in the room about um, the, uh, I think, very heartfelt pleas that uh, President of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, made um, in the newspapers sometime around the end of September and the beginning of October. She was publishing editorials um, and making statements to the BBC and other places about um, the need for a response, um, uh, knowing that Liberia, I think probably more than many of the others, or probably just as much, is in dire straits um, and likely to tumble from whatever uh, advancements they had made in peace and in development in the country. It was all being lost because of the resources that were uh, pouring into uh, the management and treatment of Ebola. And she said, um, it was not a coincidence that Ebola had taken hold in three fragile states, all battling to overcome the effects of interconnected wars. And that because of that, these interconnected wars and the fragility of, this t of, of, of the country, um, she pointed out that uh, of the 3,000 qualified doctors that had been based in uh, Liberia in the 1980s, they were now done, down to just, um, I guess she says, just three dozen. So imagine a country that had only three dozen physicians, and all of those physicians' activities being already so um, you know, uh, overstretched um, with not enough um, uh, support and too many patients to look after, then having to manage a crisis like this one. Um, and we do know that the diaspora from countries like Liberia have ended up benefiting our country. They've come to Canada, they've come to the United States, uh, they've they, you know, been deposited, they get deposited themselves in countries all over Europe. Um, and the, the question then about what sorts of obligations we owe, knowing that we have benefited from uh, that brain drain, essentially from the countries, uh, whose responsibility was it now to take care of those patients, given that we had all the doctors over here and they had all the need over there? Uh, Peter Singer, not the Peter Singer from Toronto, by the way, but the uh, uh, Peter Singer based at Princeton, the Australian Peter Singer philosopher, very controversial. In fact, the only time that I've ever been at a conference with Peter Singer, it was the only conference where his talk had to be pulled because there was a bomb threat. That's how controversial a speaker he is, um, usually about other sorts of things, not about this. Um, but you might know his website, um, uh, uh, The Poverty Project, in which he's been recommending that individuals really think, consider, consider very strongly um, do donating as much as 10% of your income to, uh, to uh, world poverty, um, with the assumption actually what he has said is that we should all be giving up as much as we need to in order to um, even things out. And once, uh, once world, once really global disparities have been rectified, after that, we can start thinking about, um, uh, 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 I guess, gaming in other sorts of ways. So really quite a controversial thinker. Um, but he pointed out, of course, that uh, one of the reasons, so another reason, not just the brain drain of medical practitioners, but another big reason why Ebola had taken hold in these countries and wasn't letting go was because of the 90-10 split, or what he was, he was borrowing the notion of the 90-10 rule. He said where 90% of medical research is directed toward illnesses that comprise only 10% of the global burden of disease. And what he had suggested is that if we were more attentive to issues um, of lower and middle income countries or people in lower and middle income countries, that Ebola would not have had the fight that it, I'm sorry, would, would not have had taken a, a, a hold in the way that it has. Um, as he says, what is it indeed, pharmaceutical companies could expect to earn more from a cure for male baldness, and so they had no incentive to uh, promote or um, at this stage, I guess, even to make available uh, at a decent cost um, uh, medication for Ebola. So the playing field definitely uneven, and uh, the question about how we have benefited from the 90-10 split 
and we have benefited from the uh, brain drain of great practitioners from other countries, from lower middle countries, um, leads us to wonder whose obligation was it to respond in a case like this. Um, was it just a matter of saying, well, this is a problem for lower and middle income countries, a problem for them to take care of, and we shouldn't be asking our health practitioners to take the kinds of risks that would be required of them to go overseas and be exposed to, um, to Ebola, to um, be exposed to other infections as well. Um, fortunately, that didn't prevent the humanitarian response, but even early on, I had emails from colleagues who are humanitarian practitioners part of their time, and they would say, you know, these are the emails I'm getting. And certainly at one point, Red Cross Canada was asking people to go either to Ebola-affected countries or to northern Iraq, where ISIL was, um, was active. And they looked at that and thought, which one am I supposed to choose from? And imagine choosing Northern Iraq, which some were. Um, so I worried a little bit about how, I don't know if you remember, and I've mentioned this to some of you before, but um, uh, after Haiti, after the earthquake in Haiti, there was a huge upswell of uh, you know, very well-meaning health practitioners who wanted to go, and people who were capable and who were willing, and they were up and going. They were taking their vacation and, and just getting on airplanes and going to Haiti. Um, quite the opposite seemed to be happening in Ebola, and I was concerned that all of that good um, goodwill that had been generated um, after the one crisis uh, would be lost um, when health practitioners realized that they were going to then be asked to volunteer. And what does it mean then to be asked to volunteer and know that the, uh, the experience that you're going to have is going to be potentially lethal? So that raises the question about the clinical settings there and what was it going to be like when people did eventually go. Um, fortunately, it took a little while, a three month lag, was it, Ross? It took a little while, um, but eventually uh, so the MSF went in. Now we're seeing not just MSF, Red Cross is there. Um, uh, the militaries of various different countries are also setting up. So the UK has had a hospital there uh, man operated by uh, military health practitioners. Um, but it still means that the safety issues are pretty strict, uh, pretty stringent. And um, the stories that we've been hearing are wondering how do you treat patients safely when you're wearing a hazmat suit. So, you know, as the story goes, you go in, you get one hour in your hazmat suit because it's way too hot there, um, too hot to keep anybody in it for a long period of time and it's not safe. Um, they go in wearing their hazmat suits and are asked, you know, you can see the fellow, he's got almost blinkers on. Uh, he'll be wearing at least two sets of gloves. They're pretty thick, it's clunky, and you, you're looking like a spaceman, so they're feeling already uh, like they're worried that they're um, uh, uh, disparate, I guess, and, and um, uh, strange looking to their patients. Um, but on top of it, then they're being asked to do things like um, put in an intravenous line. And the concerns about the possibility of infection through needle stick injuries and things like that have led some organizations actually to refuse to provide intravenous at all. Um, and that raises the next question about what then becomes an acceptable standard of treatment. Um, because in North America, at the very least, and I'm sure some of you speaking to us are asking questions, um, but I, in, in the North American context, why are they working? Shall I continue? Yes. Can you, can you mute your microphones, please, yeah. at the other end? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, what would constitute an accepted standard of treatment um, since one of the concerns about any kind of standard of treatment was that it might be uh, uh, it might be a possible risk of exposure for uh, the clinicians involved. Um, and what we do know is that, and I don't know if you can see it, but here behind this, so here is a picture of, uh, this is the nurse who was infected in Texas. Uh, she was eventually hospitalized, um, and you can see that the look of her hospital setting quite different from the uh, on the ground tent with mattresses, 
sometimes these uh, tent hospitals had been so filled up that there were waiting you know, people waiting outside um, trying to get a bed in. Um, this one doesn't look quite so overcrowded, and it's certainly very well managed, um, but it's a different sort of setup. Uh, nurses here, and the nurse who just, as I understand it, has had some pretty good news in Scotland, the one who was infected most recently. She looked like she was um, uh, quite seriously ill with advanced illness. She's actually doing quite well now. Um, but these are people who are receiving not just uh, uh, ordinary analgesics and oral care, um, oral hydration, but they're receiving IV hydration and other things like um, uh, uh, kidney dialysis in order to keep them alive. And these are things that are just, this is a standard that hasn't been available in the tent clinics, at least not until now. Uh, there is some question about whether or not they would be available in clinical trials, um, but I don't know how you manage to do that. So uh, then, then the next issue became the disparities question. So not only do we not know what a standard of care should be and um, or is and, and ought to be in these two different settings, but of course the disparity of who's going to get what and how they're going to get it. And of course you'll know that early on uh, the very, very rare um, uh, amounts of one treatment, ZMAP, uh, was being given to patients in North America, uh, but wasn't made available in West Africa to people who were dying, including frontline workers. Um, so what was it that the clinicians want? And I've used this, um, this quote before in another talk, but I still think it's such a, a remarkable quote. It's worth sharing again. And, um, this was from a medical director from MSF who in October said that what they need is the rapid development and deployment of safe and effective experimental treatments is critical. So interesting, they want it safe and effective, but they know it's experimental. Interesting um, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, conglomeration of concepts there together. Um, but, but certainly a very realistic demand under the circumstances. Um, and then he goes on to say that today doctors and nurses involved in the struggle against Ebola are getting more and more frustrated. They have no treatment for patients with a disease that kills up to 80% of them. So the problem for them, sorry, the problem for the clinicians, of course, and those going abroad, those who were there already, the local clinicians, um, was seeing patients not knowing what they had to offer them, not knowing what the standard of care or standard of practice ought to be, and knowing that the only thing available to them would be to enroll patients, in, or to, I guess, offer patients um, emergency access to uh, cl cl clinically untested, you know, non-evidence-based treatments. That was the only thing that was available for them. And so that leads to the problems of research and why research ethics becomes part of the picture. And what we know about research ethics is that the standard clinical trials, the randomized controlled trials, this was a model that just couldn't fit the context. Um, first of all, how could we, according to the gold standard, how could we randomize to placebo in a context like Ebola, where people were within weeks probably going to die? So it's not, we're not talking about months and maybe things could change over a period of time, but 21 days, right, and a person could possibly die from it. So how do you randomize to placebo? How do you say to them, to some of them, look, we really have equipoise, we don't know if this drug is going to work, we don't even know if it could kill you, but it's the only thing we have on offer, and some of you are going to get it, and some of you are not. How do we realistically do that? How do we even randomize at all? Even if we said we were going to randomize you to um, a standard of care treatment, which is what we tend to recommend um, ethically, in randomized controlled trials, if there's a standard controlled treatment, all for that instead. But in this case, we don't even know what the standard is. And if we did call anything a standard, it would be supportive care and nothing more. And that still wouldn't have made the difference, right? So how do we randomize at all? Um, there's no doubt about it then that the conclusion, and I think the conclusion you know, remains, that we need innovative research design. And this is something that you know, I would put to all of you, those of you who are involved in clinical research and trial designs and methodology at all, how do we recreate the situation, thinking about new ways to evolve, new ways to consider how we're going to do research. And it's interesting because as this is happening in an emergency situation, um, there are people, there have been people who've been asking a similar question in a slower pace 
for other contexts in the world. So it's not new. And having just been to um, CIHR meetings last week, I can tell you that it's high on the agenda of interest for even CIHR within the context of Canada and clinical research in Canada, that we, they're saying we need new approaches to clinical trial research. Um, and of course, last year, our own department, Clin Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics, had a session on should, called Should We Retire or Is It Time to Retire the Clinical Trial? So they were thinking about it, we've all been thinking about it, and now we're in a crisis where we don't have a choice, but we have to approach things differently than we had before. And if we're going to have innovative research design, we need innovative ethics review. And we need to proceed apace because we're looking at these brand new designs and have no idea whether or not it's going to meet criteria of standard, either whether international or local ethics review and legal um, review at the same time. So we need to be thinking about that and I think it's one of the next steps for the working group. Um, there are many, many special topics emerging for Ebola research ethics. Um, I, close to my heart, the one that I've taken my, I've, I've taken the banner for is the inclusion of pregnant women in clinical trial research. Um, it, it baffles my mind uh, how it is that in a clinical setting, a doctor is supposed to say to a woman, huh, congratulations, you're pregnant, um, but I'm afraid that we can't do anything to treat your Ebola. Um, why not? For the most part, the reason that's being given is embryo toxicity. But what we know about Ebola is that there has never been a live birth to any woman ever infected with Ebola. Even if the mother survives, the baby has always died. Mostly they've died in the womb. One was born living, died within a couple of days. And as I understand it, the, the, the um, viral load in the placenta of, of pre presence of Ebola was so high um, that the baby just didn't stand a chance. So we're not looking at the interests of unborn babies any longer. That's not relevant here. The only interests that we have are to the mother, the woman herself, the woman who should be making a decision anyway about whether or not she's willing to take these risks on herself and for her, her unborn child. Um, but in this case, the unborn child has no interest. The unborn child is going to die. Um, she also may have other people who she's interested in protecting the interests of, and in particular, she may have other children who she is already responsible to. And so when we're pitting these interests against one another, it seems no contest, but at any rate, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed that pregnant women have not been included, have been uh, systematically excluded from some clinical research uh, because of concerns about embryo toxicity when their babies will not survive. Um, so that's my, you know, my, there are other things as well. Um, you know, the, the use of these experimental drugs, not just uh, in research settings, but really as means of treatment. This is a big question that needs to be attended to. Um, and especially since there are people in other settings who are looking for emergency use, like cancer patients. This has been uh, discussed in the UK most recently. Um, cancer patients wanting access um, uh, with, you know, for emergency use for themselves um, of uh, experimental drugs and not gaining access to it um, for various, to them for various reasons. Um, big problems about biohacking, there are lots of samples being taken, uh, being stored up, whether for clinical purposes or for research. Um, who owns those samples, who's going to have access to the samples, how they're going to be used, whether or not they're transferred outside of their countries, um, how we store them and manage them because they're all biohazards. So many difficult issues that come along with that. Um, the interests of children very much like women. How do we manage the interests of children, uh, particularly surviving children? So there will be orphans. There already are orphans uh, from Ebola whose family, whose um, you know, distant relatives and neighbors and friends uh, are afraid to go near them because they seem like they may be infected and there's some fear and misunderstanding about uh, uh, whether or not the children continue to be affected. Uh, those who survive Ebola themselves, there's concern about them uh, becoming, uh, there's already been a black market for uh, blood, uh, blood um, uh, source uh, for the, the plasma um, for treatment, um, sorry, I'm losing it, I, I know I'm in a hurry. Uh, so the, the treating patients with um, uh, pl the convalescent plasma serum, uh, my concern certainly for the, for the orphans will be protecting their interests and making sure that they just harvesters, um, you know, uh, living, living harvests 
for um, treatments for Ebola for future patients. Um, accessing the scarce resource, we know that uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies even with the best of intentions, um, even those with the best of intentions, uh, are not able to generate enough drug um, of any sort uh, to treat all of the patients um, uh, affected. So how will we manage the scarcity even of the experimental drugs? And of course, what I was talking about before, the ethics lag, us not knowing how to answer these questions because many of them are so new. Um, not that new, though, when you consider that in 1990, uh, the Concerted European Action for Coping with Disaster had a meeting in Paris, and at the Paris meeting, they at least were very clear uh, making a statement about uh, not having uh, placebo RCTs. They said it's unethical to withhold any intervention from victims of disasters, um, and that we have to define at for, uh, sorry, have to define first uh, what is the minimal ethical intervention, and then second, um, consider uh, uh, the procedure can be offered to any participant um, who is involved in the disaster. Um, also, there have been, uh, you know, particularly post-tsunami, there was quite a lot of discussion about doing research in uh, post-disaster settings. Uh, the group, uh, which consists of Bioethicists all from Asia, who published from the Asian Bioethics Review, uh, they listed 12 um, uh, ethical uh, considerations, I guess, for doing research um, uh, in, uh, uh, in post-disaster settings. Many of these are not new, they're just reiterations of uh, existing policy statements. Um, and some of them are updated. I'm not going to go into each one. I just want to show to you that there are these sorts of statements. Um, indeed, the uh, ELRA group uh, funders who fund research related specifically to um, disaster settings, they created a, a framework, and actually Art Kaplan was on the working group too. So uh, they created a framework for all research that's done in disaster settings. Uh, so that there will be some consideration of the ethical um, issues. And actually, if you make an application to LRAD, to their R2HC um, uh, 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 funding protocols, uh, they require you to fill in a statement indicating that you've considered all of these issues. And of course, the first question at the very top of the list, why must this research be conducted during a humanitarian crisis or emergency? Um, is the context, does, it, does the context require that it has to be done? Does the research require that it has to be done in this context? Uh, at MSF, the Ethics Review Board created a uh, statement, and I know my esteemed colleague Ross was involved in the development of this statement. Um, also, a lot of guidance for researchers who are going to be doing uh, research in uh, humanitarian settings, whether it's crisis or development. Um, this is a reflective set of questions that can be incorporated into, again, not just your ethics review proposal, but your application, your proposal itself, and the protocol itself. Um, asking questions on uh, issues related to research, uh, the research question itself, uh, and the, the validity and the viability of it, uh, the methodology that's being chosen, uh, respecting and protecting research participants and their communities, um, and then the implications and the implementation um, following the research of the research findings. So they've asked us to think about things from, from these three uh, perspectives. And it's a, it's a great approach because it asks you to do this while you're developing your protocol. And you can insert it right in, and the nice thing, of course, with that is that you can just cut and paste into your ethics, your ethics um, uh, uh, form and it saves you so much more trouble. Um, but at least the reflection is there, and I think it's probably a better framework than um, check boxes and the sorts of things that you often see in other contexts. So that's the research part of it. Um, down to the very last couple of slides, um, the philosopher in me, uh, you know, is, is really struck uh, just by the moral experience of what's going on in the context of you know, West Africa, in the context of Ebola, how we were responding to it over here. Um, this picture, I think, you know, it, it states a thousand words, um, but it's worth mentioning that I found it in an article by Bob Hale, a philosopher from Australia, who uh, published an editorial in Slate magazine in September. Um, 
And the article is called something like uh, the most terrifying thing about Ebola. Um, and what he says the most terrifying thing about Ebola is, is that it preys on our most human instincts. As he puts it, the virus preys on care and love, piggybacking on the deepest, most distinctively human virtues. Affected parties are almost all medical professionals and family members snared by Ebola while in the business of caring. And it's exactly our instinct to touch, our instinct to care, to coddle, to look after a small child, a dying person, that is exactly how Ebola transmits itself. Um, but it seems like the alternative is that much more. So, what do we do? And the kinds of questions that I would put to you, particularly as students. Um, just a few things off the top of my mind late the other day. Um, how do we encourage rapid, safe development of treatments and make them available to everybody, not just people in the global north who um, might be able to afford to pay for the new treatments? Um, how do we encourage governments to help even the playing field so that uh, we have public health availability in countries all over the world, um, even in the most fragile places, you know, even in countries where they're trying to rebuild, and in places where they've had to make genuine choices between an educational system and a public health system. And then how do we make care delivery safe for healthcare workers on the front lines? Um, that's a very practical question and an interesting question that Johns Hopkins put to some of its students um, who together, I guess, working in a, a um, uh, working in interdisciplinary groups, but starting from engineering and healthcare and various other things, came up with a, a session. They did a, a, I don't know if it was a full day or a full week session, um, asking for innovative designs for treating Ebola. But I don't think we're going to find it today because it's not popping up on the uh, on the website. Maybe we don't have access or something. Ah, there's one. So here it is. Um, this group here, um, actually there is a two minute video, but I, I don't know if I can show it to you. Maybe I'll, I'll show it to you as I'm speaking, but this group here um, de designed, <laughs> the music is terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something else with that. Yeah, you got some people But they designed just, you know, near protective suits. Um, you can already see that the vision is, is less obscured. Um, far more comfortable. Apparently, they um, they breathe um, so that it's not quite so hot inside the suit. You can spend a little bit longer inside of it, but it's still completely protected. Um, and if I can skip forward, um, you'll see that the really neat thing, because one of the biggest problems has been um, the, the the disrobing, the, the taking off of the gear, the doffing process. So they simplified the doffing process so you don't actually even have to touch the suit. So it's quite remarkable. I mean, it's a little bit of origami and a little bit of shoelace tying, I guess. Um, but they remarkably designed this thing. I, you know, with a very devoted um, engineering group across campus, we've got health practitioners here, policy people here. I couldn't help but wonder why McMaster hasn't engaged in a similar one-day exercise or one-week exercise to develop something quite as remarkable as this. I think that's the one that won the award, so you can imagine why that was the, was the case. Um, at any rate, I don't know how to get back to the presentation. Uh, is that my presentation? I'm not sure. Right, so I don't know how to get back there. Right, uh, so if you're interested in ethics and humanitarian engagement, uh, this is just a plug for the research program that I'm involved with. Uh, we're, we, we're at UMEFNET, Humanitarian Health Ethics Net. Uh, you can find us online. Um, also, if you're interested in global health research, the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research has a liaison committee right here on campus, and students are certainly welcome to participate. So I'm gonna now pass it on to um, so if you have any questions, we just ask that you hold them till the end of Dr. Usher's talk. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz, for enlightening us about some of the special considerations and background regarding Ebola, especially with research design, something that I know we're all intimately involved with at this point in our master's, if you are in global health. Um, 
Recording stopped. <laughs> um, next up, we have Dr. Russ Upcher, who has a BA and MA in philosophy and an MSc in epidemiology, as well as an MD from McMaster in medicine. Um, Dr. Upshur is currently the Canadian Research Chair in Primary Care Research and head of the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health at U of T. Uh, I hope I got all of that right. <laughs> um, he will continue our discussion about how competing visions of research in this context and the ethical considerations that we must look at. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the honor and privilege of coming to speak to you today. Before we start, is there anybody in the room that's returned from West Africa uh, that was out there? There are now cohorts of people coming back. If there were, I was going to invite them to come up and give a talk because they would be able to speak much more informatively than. Than I do. So Lisa gave you a very coherent uh, presentation. Uh, I'm still in the stage of arching coherence about this because I'm still not sure how it's all going to settle out. We're not over, I mean, if you looked at the Google hits for the year, there was this massive outpouring of interest uh, uh, online. Recording started. Sorry. <laughs> in, in, uh, in October, but it's almost like if you're, if you didn't know better, you'd think that it's all over and done with. But there's still quite a lot of intense transmission, uh, particularly in parts of Sierra Leone. Liberia seems to be under control. But uh, what I'm going to uh, warn you is to be careful about any uh, rash statements of it being controlled, because it's not over and done with until the very last case has been contact traced. And then and 42 days have passed. So anybody who's done communicable disease epidemiology and outbreak management know it starts weird. It gets weirder, and it gets into a surreal phase. Then there's the point where humans wish they could will it away by fiat, but uh, there's kind of a biological imperative here that uh, we don't control. So I'm going to be a little more impressionistic, uh, because I'm still trying to get my head around the multiplicity of issues that have been raised by this outbreak. Uh, some of them are structurally and eerily similar to uh, public health events of major consequence that have occurred in my lifetime. I don't think I'm that old yet. Uh, that these learnings from, say, SARS, H1N1 uh, are not relevant, but it seems sometimes as if uh, we as a species have kind of a collective Korsakoff syndrome where our short-term memory is impaired and we can't remember what we learned from previous disasters. Um, so, WHO had, you know, there's a, uh, Ebola's been destructive in, in ways that are really hard to actually capture. So Margaret Chen, who's been under a considerable uh, uh, criticism for the way the WHO uh, has handled the situation. She said, uh, it's, Ebola is the greatest peacetime challenge in the UN history. She said, this is likely the greatest peacetime challenge that the United Nations and its agencies have ever faced. None of us experienced in containing outbreaks has ever seen in our lifetimes an emergency on this scale with the degree of suffering and with the magnitude of cascading consequences. The cascading consequences will be going on for several years and I'll sort of speak to them a little bit towards the end. But the first point to take away from this is that none of this need to have happened. Uh, Ebola is a disease that can be controlled with basic bread and butter public health interventions such as isolation, contact tracing, and follow-up. And in fact, the last 23 or 24 outbreaks of Ebola before this were all contained in under-resourced areas because of early identification. So you might ask, what makes it different here? One was nobody knew that the, uh, you know, the reservoir of fruit bats, which are the kind of identified zoonotic reservoir, extended into West Africa. But the second thing was there was a lull in the action. So I've been involved on this portfolio since back in March, April, uh, when MSF was doing a post-exposure prophylaxis protocol. Uh, but everybody thought during, so you, you can ask the question, what happened in April and May before things started to gear up in June, July, and August? And Tom Green, who's the director of the CDC, you know, everybody thought they had it under control. And there's an excellent article in the New York Times just last week that documents what happened between the identification of the outbreak of Ebola in Guinea and the end of March in 2014, even though we know it started back in December. There was this two-month lull in which everybody seemed to think that they had it under control, but they had hopelessly underestimated it because of the belief in artificial borders, when if you look at that map, the, uh, where Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia interact, there's kind of uh, a lot of travel across non-existent borders in non-existent countries with non-existent infrastructure. So the whole point of the matter is that this could have been brought, and, and I know I've heard it from thousands of my 
public health colleagues. Ross, what are you doing with all this experimental therapy stuff? This could have been stopped with public health. Yes, but you need to have public health in place to stop it in the first place, and it wasn't there. And what you had were humanitarian NGOs that have an ambivalent relationship with public health, uh, doing most of the clinical care, and then trying to get involved a little bit and say, do we do contact tracing? Yes, we do. What about isolation and enforced quarantine? Well, we're not so sure about that. It's really not good for quarantine to quarantine people if you're in man. It's not very humanitarian to say you're not allowed to go out of this treatment center if you want to go out. So there's huge issues. So uh, as I said, I'm going to be a bit incoherent because I'm still trying to grapple with a lot of these issues. So this greatest peacetime challenge that the United Nations and its agencies have ever faced was an utterly preventable event. And all of you who are interested in global health, please take your public health seriously, learn about prevention, get engaged. If you want to make a difference, go out and do global public health, that's my pitch there. Uh, so, uh, Voltaire did not believe that optimism was a bioethicist with a beeper or a pager. Uh, he said it's a mania for saying things that are well when one is in hell. So I, I kind of like, you'll see I'm trying to say, well, you know, my thinking kind of gravitates between the poles of optimism some days and, of course, pessimism on other days. Now, of course, I violated, there's too much text here, and of course, Schopenhauer, the great German pessimist, and if ever there was a visage of a pessimist, there it is. This is a, and, and he was an utterly unpleasant man, the truth. Uh, but what he's trying to argue here, so the, the trick here is, of course, Voltaire is coming out of Candide. Candide was a satire on Leibniz's The Odyssey. That was the claim that this is the best of all possible worlds. Schopenhauer picking up on that said, this can't possibly be the case. Uh, this is the, you know, uh, uh, since the worst world could not continue to exist, it is absolutely impossible. So this world itself is the worst of all possible worlds. So some days I wake up and it's sort of an okay world, some days it's an awful world, and some days it's a, a decent world. And in my comments and in my reflections, I'm gonna go back and forth between these poles. Um, so part of this has to do with the still persistent belief, even by world public health, you know, public health organizations, that you know, the time has come to close the book on infectious diseases. We have basically wiped out infection in the United States. I am hoping to get through my career without having any such comment attributed to me. Because of course, since 1967, there's been at least 40 identified new uh, emerging infectious diseases, Ebola being one of them. Um, then there's this, uh, so this is George Santayana, another philosopher, and in his, everybody knows this famous quotation that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, I'm wondering what the least unit of time for recollection for us as a species is because it clearly doesn't extend back five years to the H1N1. People remember H1N1 and a couple of SARS. Anybody out there remember SARS? Good. So we got a little bit of collective memory going on. Uh, because even when we were doing, uh, as you know, I chaired the working group that, that Lisa was mentioning uh, and I also worked on chairing the working group for the WHO during H1N1 and one of the, the, the task force group that I, changed, that I chaired was on health worker obligations and infectious disease outbreaks. And you would swear to God that document did not exist because here we are with Ebola and people are scratching their chin saying, do we have an obligation to provide care? And, and you know, I did a whole thing on Ebola. So there, in WHO I wasn't even aware and that, well no, this is Ebola, not influenza. And I said, well, they're both infections, the structural issues, the ethical issues are the same. And it was gonna be that we were gonna repeat all of the documents for Ebola and because it's a different thing. So the idea for us to sort of think laterally and learn and actually bring forward things that we learned uh, four or five years ago and bring them to the current context is something that wasn't evident and we still have to push for that. So sometimes I think, do we learn? No, do we want to learn? Not really, why? Because it's actually, I don't know, maybe it's satisfying to relive the terror and horror of this every time something new happens. But the other thing is, back to the point, uh, we also, when people are critical of the World Health Organization, you must remember that the difference in budget between the WHO and MSF, for example, is only about $1 billion, $2.6 to $3.6 billion. And the WHO was forced to make dramatic budget cuts. Who made them make those dramatic budget cuts? Our nation states, because the WHO is a UN organization. When they were giving their marching orders, there was a special meeting in uh, New York in 2012 about the epidemic of chronic diseases. Yes, you know, I'm a physician, so I like you know, doing my, my clinical work is in chronic disease, my public health is in clinical disease. I don't really have a preference for one thing that makes humans unwell or miserable. But because of this global emergency on chronic disease, they ended up cutting the epidemic response group by 50%. 
which meant that there was not, and that meant all of the acquired wisdom, the institutional memory, a lot of the Ebola hands were suddenly elsewhere. So there was actually very little uh, response capacity from the WHO uh, back in uh, April, May, and June. So threat to peace and security, uh, yes. Uh, Lisa very much touched on the difficulties of providing care. I hope that that innovative suit is scalable. Uh, for the clinicians in the audience, you're actually double gloved and then you put on something like you know big thick rubber gloves, and imagine people with Ebola are quite dehydrated, so they got flat vessels, and you're trying to take a pulse and get blood pressure, and you can only stay an hour in. Uh, it's really and back in September October, it's really ghastly to to realize what those treatment centers were like. They were like the you know ninth ring of hell. People were bringing people and leaving them at the door. Children were dying right out in front of the treatment center. And the you know, MSF knew and it takes 35 minutes, 30 minutes to get on, 30 minutes to get off, an hour in, and you don't run out to that kid that's clearly suffering and dying in front of you without going through this process, or you end up in one of the beds in the treatment center. So any kind of innovation in personal protection, if you're interested in occupational health and hygiene, here's an opportunity. And one of the interesting things, you know, these students were asking how they can get involved. So at the U of T in our school, we've got four working groups. One of them was a group of occupational health uh, students. And they've actually got a group, uh, they got donations of personal protective equipment, and actually just last week delivered a container to a hospital in Sierra Leone. So there's lots of innovative ways you can get involved, because if you don't have your, your credentials, and there's really, if you have any health professions or epidemiology or public health training, and you got a month to spare, uh, you know, you're welcome over there. Harper might make it a little difficult for you coming back. We can try to work on that a little bit by pointing out that you can have a travel ban and all that name, but just don't call it a travel ban. You have restrictive visas coming in, and you make it really difficult for people when they come back. So the clinical realities are very difficult. It's getting a little bit better. Now there's more treatment centers. But the, this, this virus keeps confounding us because what they were doing, and you might recall back in October, uh, the United States was going to build 17 treatment centers of 100 beds, 1,700 beds, and it's about a four to one ratio. So for each patient, you need four healthcare providers. You can only stay for about a month, is what the recommended tour. So if you do the math there, 1,700 beds times four, that's 6,800 healthcare workers for uh, each month. Multiply that over by the next year that you're going to try. So you're trying to plan for all of this, right? Can't just sort of show up. That's a heck of a lot of healthcare providers. And people were celebrating Cuba's great standing up for solidarity, and they sent 300 healthcare workers. The United States was not sending healthcare workers to staff these 100, 100 bed treatment centers, but they were going to train up 500 local providers. So 500 plus 300 equals 800. Uh, that's somewhat short of the 80,000 that was anticipated back in the fall. And of course, as I'll come to very shortly, the models were wrong. I've already alluded to the fact that uh, there were some very difficult decisions that humanitarian organizations had to make about the use of restrictive measures. In the absence of a, so Fran's there, Fran's been a medical officer, I've been a medical officer. If I knew somebody is a you know, confirmed case of Ebola, it would be not a very straightforward or difficult, it's a, you know, it's a pretty straightforward decision. You're not going anywhere, you're sitting in that, to, to, you know, you're born, you're isolated, you cannot move, I write an order, I've got the public health authority to do that. I know it's not nice, we'll support you through reciprocity, uh, but you are not leaving an isolation ward until you're either unfortunately dead or cured, because otherwise this is just going to go on. MSF and humanitarian medical organizations do not have the legal authority to quarantine or isolate or otherwise command people to do anything. And so this started with a, a case uh, uh, where uh, somebody got out and they filmed it and the guy came up in an MSF shirt and was trying to persuade him and the guy didn't want to go back because he was hungry. You know, it's not an uncommon thing to be. And why would you want to stay in a gnarly treatment center in the first place? And then sort of poor people in those hazmat suits like this come out, pick them up, bundle them up, and stick them in the back of a pickup truck and take them back. So I went when Lisa was part of our meetings with MSF and said, we're like, what is the warrant for you to actually be able to do that? And of course, they don't have one. And there is public health law in Liberia. There was at one time a functioning public health system. But in fact, there was no, I mean, if you know the political history of Liberia, terrible civil war. Uh, they've got more soldiers and healthcare providers by about three or four orders of magnitude. And that's why they started to use soldiers to try to ring off one of the poor neighborhoods in Monrovia. So the game changer with this outbreak as compared to other Ebola outbreaks is that Ebola had never gotten into a crowded urban setting before. And very quickly, they were at tertiary, quaternary levels of transmission, and there was no way to piece together contact tracing. So it was just, a, it was a perfect nightmare 
storm, and that's why it's become such a challenge. So public health's been fighting from behind because there's still not enough contact tracers. Communities are suspicious. So I'll get to, uh, you know, so Sierra Leone tried the first things, like uh, everybody stay home for three days and we're gonna go door to door and find the sick people and take them to treatment centers. This was back in September and it didn't work because transmission still continues uh, uh, intensely in Sierra Leone. Uh, Lisa mentioned this is where things get weird. There's a black market for survivor's blood. And remember, this is a heavy, there's lots of guns in downtown Monrovia. There's lots of guns in Sierra Leone and Guinea. There was intense civil wars and there's lots of gangs. So if you're an enterprising, entrepreneurial soul, and there's this, lots of rumors going around that blood of recovered uh, uh, Ebola patients is actually valuable, well, you know, you might want to round up a few of them and start a little business on the side, and that's in fact what's happening. So there's some very, very disturbing things that have been occurring on the ground. The other one is, is owning up the limitations of epidemiology. So I alluded to the fact earlier uh, that we need, math we need mathematical models for rational planning. And on aggregate, they've been pretty good early, but if you look back at the modeling literature to September, it was going to be in you know, Tucson, Arizona by now. It was going to spread around the world rapidly, and there were going to be 10,000 cases a week by the end of December. None of this happened. And I love this article from Nature. You know, The models overestimated the cases, and the modelers were complaining. They said, you know, if we only had granular data you know, about you know, who, where, what, you know, if we had better data, we'd have better models. But if you're able to collect better data, you'd have a functioning health system. If you had a functioning health system, you wouldn't have an Ebola outbreak in the first place. So we need to really think clearly about how we manage uncertainty for modeling, because saying that you need 80,000 healthcare providers to staff 1,700 beds and treatment centers, you've got somebody has to think about how, plus all the personal protection. Right? Because those suits come off and on every day. You don't reuse them. They get discarded. They need to be incinerated. Uh, so there's all sorts of logistical supply line things that need to be calculated fairly precisely. So we do need good models, but the models have actually underperformed. So we need to think about how we're going to use innovation to get better real-time data to more nuanced. Uh, so this is where the pessimism starts to come in, like dream or else you can dream. That we'll get to actually informative data in real time that would actually allow us to respond to some of these challenges. Um, so then now, of course, here we are in November, you've got a dramatic improvement in Ebola in, in, in Liberia. Actually, one of the MSF treatment centers has closed in Lopa, uh, which is one of the first areas that was hit. EWAS 2, which was the big, they had 300 beds there, there's only a handful of patients, and of course now they're scaling up the clinical trials, and now they're having to move it out of that treatment center because there's, now people are actually lamenting that there's not enough patients for clinical trials, which I think frankly is bizarre. I think, you know, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for the discussion. Um, and of course, there's the whole issue about trust in, in very conflict-ridden zones. There was uh, one set of uh, health promoters and epidemiologists were going out into rural Guinea, and they uh, slew the whole team because there's this need again to, uh, it's so multidimensional now, I'm starting to sound like a raving lunatic, I know. But, but social science has played a role. So we've been mobilizing anthropologists, people working with communities to actually understand, you know, it's very simple, easy to say over here, well, you know, just change your burial customs, guys. Well, they actually care for their pet. They put their hands on the dead. It's not like, you know, what happens when we die here? Like everybody says adios and they pop you in. I'm sorry. You know, they don't actually help care for you and dress the body. It's not considered part, it's not a ritual, it's a human practice. And human practices vary. And if you don't understand the meaning of death to a certain culture, you're not going to be able to actually affect change. And one of the things that's turned things around, particularly in Liberia, was safe burial practices because burials were actually the generator uh, of, of infections because people would actually wash the bodies and the bodies were actually shedding a considerable amount of virus. So changing the burial practices had a lot of uh, effect here. And this is one of the good news. This is back to the optimism <coughs> side. So I remember, because I, I get grumpy and pessimistic most of the time, and I remember sitting around, I think maybe it was with our colleagues, and said, if we're relying on behavior change to control this Ebola outbreak, we are SOL, because look at smoking, look at physical activity, look at obesity. How much has behavior change actually done? But actually, behavior change has been the only effective thing that's come into play here. It's the only thing that can account for uh, some of the declines, plus better contact tracing, plus a little bit better treatment facility. Uh, Ebola has been devastating to healthcare providers. Uh, it's actually taken out uh, more, uh, if you look at it, it's a percentage rate, because remember Lisa's comment, there weren't a lot of healthcare providers there in the first place, and so any you know, physician, nurse, or trained healthcare provider in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and, uh, uh, and Liberia that 
that's sick and died is actually taking quite a lot out. And I don't think we've actually been able to calculate the uh, rates specific to healthcare providers. We've got some case fatality rates, and but we don't actually know what the how much an increased hazard of being a healthcare provider is for getting a bullet and dying. And MSF had their first expat death. We had their first, uh, you know, they had a clean record of everybody working in any Ebola centers and never having a transition to a healthcare provider, and, and that's changed in this outbreak. So these are just a smattering of headlines over the last four days, and then in my last few minutes, because I want to spend more time talking with you than speaking at you, from the last few days. So WHO warrants Ebola is still spreading. So all of the belief that it's not still a big problem uh, should just let, just disabuse yourself of that. It's still spreading, it's still on. Effort on Ebola hurt WHO chief. The WHO's credibility, uh, at least they owned up to it. They said, yeah, they kind of blew it. But Tom Frieden was on the BBC yesterday. Uh, he's the director of the CDC. And he said, actually, if you look back to that interval, if you're interested, read that article. It's still on the New York Times website, how Ebola roared back. When you look back at it, everybody missed. MSF missed, CDC missed. All the experience of what Ebola has, thought they had it under control, but uh, meanwhile, because they were looking at Guinea and Liberia, and they hadn't actually figured out that people walk out that the same clan and kin relationships extended to Sierra Leone, because we've got borders, those borders are imposed by somebody else, but all the people, and there's nothing between the borders, and people walk, and you can see, they've got a nice little video where you can go from Sierra Leone into uh, Liberia without much trouble, because nobody pays attention to the border. Ebola has been just so, Lisa's quotation from uh, the philosopher about care is, is really poignant, but Ebola has been destructive to organizations. So WHO has taken a huge hit. This issue about Ebola therapy, Ebola doctors are divided on the IV therapy. It's divided people within the MSF group about what the standard of care is. Paul Farmer's on in this article quoted basically of saying that uh, you know MSF is guilty of malpractice because they didn't give everybody intravenous. Now, when you've got like, and, and then when the MSF doc said, yeah, I was the one who said, we're not putting in any more intravenous because it's not safe. We don't have enough healthcare professionals and people, you know, people who are kind of agonal and dying, uh, uh, they do things like pull out their IVs and if they've got advanced, you know, Ebola still is a hemorrhagic fever uh, and in advanced late stage cases, you still get, you know, because your liver packs in, you're, you're not able to clot well. So they pull out their IVs and they bleed all over the place and that causes huge exposure. So the reason why intravenous therapy wasn't used in every case is because it was considered unsafe when they had more patients than they could actually staff you. So it's very nice for Paul Farmer to come in and Partners in Health has not been on the ground in West Africa yet, may I just point out, not gonna be critical, to say that everybody can get intravenous therapy, but also think, you know, clinicians in the room, you got these thick gloves on, you got flat veins, you know, I was an ER doc for a long time. It's, you know, so what, how are we gonna use, now we're talking about interosseous, so you just like gouge a big trocar needle into people's uh, tibia, and that causes a lot of bleeding, that's been suggested as a solution. So there's a, it's been destructive to organizations, it's been destructive, destructive within organizations, so it's not just the virus that has the ethical implications. It's actually taking a lot of people down with it. Uh, Lisa's presentation spoke beautifully to the suffering to patients, their families, and their communities. Uh, they were just recovering from a protracted 10 year terrible civil war where you know guys with guns were you know feeding kids gun uh, drugs and uh, giving them machetes and sending them into villages with uh, uh, AK 47. So it was, it was, it was a devastated. Uh, area. They were just some green shoots of democratic institutions, and now their economies have been totally ravaged. So, people know who these two guys are? I'm quickly. So, everybody knows who that is. Who is this? You remember his name from October? That's, yeah? Dr. Dr. Bramley. So, he is from, so he's from uh, Samaritan's Purse. He was the guy who got the Zed map. Anybody know who this gentleman is? This is the man you should remember. This is Dr. Farcon, who is the Sierra Leonean virologist who was a Lassa fever expert who uh, took his Lassa fever uh, uh, center and turned it into the Sierra Leone Ebola thing who contracted Ebola and died. Everybody knows him, nobody knows him. CNN had cameras all over him. It's really astonishing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll stop. Um, how is it that you can get ZMAP 
ZMAP is the monoclonal antibody uh, produced, interestingly, by a, a, out of tobacco. But you know, the, without any regulatory authority or approval, uh, an NGO can get a dose of ZMAP into two of their people. You might want to ask some questions about that. The internal side is the uh, executive director of uh, Samaritan's Purse is Billy Graham's son, who has a Rolodex that includes people in the NIH and the CDC. So he made a series of phone calls and was able to liberate a dose that happened to be circulating around West Africa. They actually took it across uh, borders in a plane without it notifying any of the national governments. And of course, they were all considered to be doing what was right and appropriate for uh, the person that was affected. So this disparity in treatment by otherwise equally deserving people uh, requires some considered uh, reflection. Almost every expat who's been evacuated has received some form of either monoclonal antibody, uh, convalescent serum, uh, dialysis. They've had the book thrown at them. Uh, probably, if I was a betting person, I would think that monoclonal antibodies might work. Uh, but certainly, there is a, if you're over 50 and an expat, uh, your mortality is similar to the mortality you see in West Africa. But on a very small sample, uh, two of 11 uh, under 50 have died. So there's a higher uh, survival rate when you have better care. And that's what's stimulated the whole standard of care debate. So Lisa has alluded. I was. Uh, a member of that first uh, meeting that said, yes, let's go ahead and uh, <laughs> why not? What else have we got to lose? Uh, there's a huge emergency. We've been talking about uh, doing research in Ebola for every Ebola outbreak. This is a big Ebola outbreak. Now's our chance to see whether therapies and vaccines may make a difference. Uh, so I was on that conference. Uh, and uh, for the public health people, I did say at that meeting, that any research ought not to undermine or cannibalize resources to the outbreak management and public health response. And then I chaired this working group where we were looking at some of these innovative study designs because the world thinks very differently. I'll conclude with some thoughts here. So you all know that it's a long process for drugs to be developed. And if you sum up this down here, it takes about uh, six years to go from uh, preclinical animal testing through to phase three or phase four registration. Um, that first meeting we had was on August 11th. The reason it was called is because on August 8th, the emergency committee of the World Health Organization convened to see whether uh, under the international health regulations, this Ebola outbreak should be declared uh, an outbreak of international concern. They did, and they quickly realized that there were several ethical issues. So between Friday and that Monday, they tried to convene the ethics panel. It wasn't actually as unrepresentative as people thought. There were people from Africa there, but there were a lot of people available from uh, uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia on three-day notice with no electronic technology. So I've taken the blame for that, but all of our further working groups have been very, very, very representative. So August 8th, <coughs> remember, is the declaration of emergency. August 11th is the green light to uh, see if we can do something with uh, investigational drugs. Some of them, I learned a ton of stuff about the animal rule and phase one studies. It's a very murky area. What falls under compassionate use? What's expanded access? Do we actually need, and I'm still worried about this, a newer justification for why, for example, an Ebola outbreak is a good reason for fast-tracking drug development as opposed to, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease or some other uniformly fatal nasty disease. So we're trying to set through and work out a bulletproof uh, argument for why we thought it was appropriate here. But, so this is important, so this is where you could be, is it good news, is it bad news? December 26th, the first clinical trial for one of the antivirals started in Guinea, so that's less than five months after the green light was given. They went through a series of candidate agents that I wouldn't want to be the person in WHO because they're at this meeting. Like everybody and their dog has something. I've been, my, was just, my inbox was just like pumpkins and carrots can cure Ebola. The homeopaths wanted to go in and run trials. Uh, turkey bile was 
is one of the ones that, so, so, so vulture bottle, vulture bottle. So they actually came up with a list of, so there were some agents that were specifically purpose designed for Ebola, such as the two or three candidate vaccines, the monoclonal antibodies. There's other agents that they have human safety data, but you have in uh, vitro data for Ebola, and we had to weigh out all of these different considerations, and you may have seen uh, the story in the paper about the Italian. Now, the, the scary part is that the West Africa has been divided into spheres of influence. Liberia is under America, like all the colonial powers have come to roost. So US, Liberia, randomized trials for FDA and regulatory approval. Uh, Sierra Leone is British, Oxford and, and Antwerp and Liverpool Consortium there, Guinea under French control. Uh, China and Russia are coming in and building treatment centers in this Italian group, started a treatment center where cardiologists uh, thought that amiodarone would be a good antiviral for, uh, 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 because there was in, you know, again, in vitro evidence that it was had antiviral properties. So as I say, things start weird, they get weirder, and now we're into a whole different playing field entirely. Um, so this has led me to be uh, reflective. So one of the questions that I've had when I was chairing some of these meetings is, why? What's the purpose of clinical trials, clinical science, evaluating um, these medications in the first place? And it seems like there's three kind of distinct spheres in, in use. Uh, if you talk to the FDA, and if you look at the article that was published a few weeks ago in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine by Borio and Cox, who were at the meeting, they know they're very clear and unequivocal, only randomized trials. And the whole purpose of doing research is to get uh, regulatory approval and licenses for marketed products. Product. And there's a whole sphere of people, and the drug companies are kind of on board there. Is it to respond to the outbreak demonstrating that humanity has used all means possible to end the outbreak, including, you know, picking up on uh, the con uh, comment from Bertrand Dardus that, you know, clinicians are tired of seeing people die without having any therapeutic interventions. We ought to try everything possible so that at the end of the day, as one of my colleagues who's an Ebola expert, Philippe Glenn, and an ethicist said, we can say that we did everything possible in this circumstance. And then there's one group, uh, and sometimes I tip into this, like, why are we doing this in the first place? Therapeutic misconception is so overwhelming uh, that maybe this isn't the time and place to be doing uh, research and experimental therapy. And uh, a very prominent uh, African bioethicist, Godfrey Trongo, has written a piece on, on this. So somewhere we need to mediate, at least in this small area, uh, where we stand on each of these things. Um, I'm still trying to sort out my own thinking on multiplicity of issues that are very complex. Uh, I've learned a lot, and like any of these experiences, uh, they're humbling. So you go out with great, uh, you know, great uh, intentions, but uh, always retain a little bit of humility because these are very complex, difficult issues, and people's lives are indeed at stake from the decisions that we make. So I'm going to stop there, and that leaves us some time to. Uh, answer some questions, and I'm sorry for being as uh, editorial and tangential as I can. That's why also one of the things we've been clear and unequivocal about so there's, so is that we need some form of monitored evaluation of any therapeutic entity. Now there's a huge debate about whether we use single arm trials with historical controls or randomized trials. Uh, we hashed all of that out in Geneva. The Oxford Consortium is doing single arm trials conditioning on 50% mortality as kind of a screen. So these antivirals, which the trials are actually powered to
But so, so it's it, the genies out of the bottle, and that's why I feel a bit conflicted. We do need to have a very good evaluative framework for that to determine whether we're exactly that. Yeah, 50% mortality is pretty gnarly, but you don't want to be killing people as well. I totally agree. Uh, but man, it's hard to return to people. <coughs> skin in the game. I kind of made that point uh, at a meeting that we were at, uh, which didn't turn me any popularity strikes. Uh, on the other, right side of the table. The other thing is that our research ethics board said we will approve pre-approved protocols. So we don't know where the next Ebola outbreak is. And everybody says, oh, this will work, that will work, this will work, that will work. Well, design a study, we'll approve it. And when the time comes, you drop it into place, you get the local approval, we'll drop everything and look at it one more time. And then seven days if you can get a quick review elsewhere. But nothing came to the table. So uh, if you know neglected diseases, Ebola is the candidate for neglected disease. There's been absolutely no research. Uh, and the other thing that I think is an important consideration in justifying why we did this here is the only way you're going to be able to tell whether the Ebola vaccine or a therapeutic works is in an Ebola outbreak. And I really don't want to see a bigger one than this one. Thank you very much. Uh, this one has been enough Ebola, I think, for our lifetimes. So that's why I think another good reason for doing this now with this particular object. But no, not a humanitarian. Is it the, uh, so there's an observation I made, rather than just a question, but it sounds like the confusion and the chaos that you observed with finding the right treatment and the vaccine uh, available to, um, to patients in, in West Africa is, is a symptom not unlike the very ethical problem that was started in the first place. That is a lack of infrastructure and a public health system in West Africa. The, the two are almost mirror images of each other's right And you see it time and again with various other diseases and conditions. Yeah, I, mean, I, guess I totally agree. I think it's a, it's a structural system of the world in the world. Yeah. Okay, so one, two, and survives too, the 
they'll be born with defects. So in that situation, which one would be better? Like the idea that what a woman survives with a child who also survives that has a kind of a defect, or is it that both of them die, or the mother survives with the child?
reports I've been part of, I've made a, a recommendation that there be, you know, it's all very nice and good if you fly in lots of expats, you create all of these clinical trial pathways, contact tracing, and then you go and you leave undisturbed a set of circumstances uh, that existed in the first place. And here I think, you know, there's a good opportunity for students here in universities to play a role in partnering and building public health capacity. So there are schools, there's not many of them. There is an association of medical schools that we're trying to build capacity in, in West Africa. I think we need to do the same for public health. So if we're gonna so if we're gonna take this seriously and not just pretend it happened, which we would do like three years from now, then we do need to make recommendations and hold somebody accountable for there being an enduring legacy of strengthening after this. Otherwise, you know, we're just being jokers again and then five years hence something else will happen somewhere else. I mean, so that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, and so at least if you label it as an issue and you make a recommendation that there should be something of enduring value that can support, uh, it might not happen. But I think a lot of the funders like the Love and Trust, the Gates Foundation, are now recognizing that if you want to be innovative on this technological front in global health, Some nations, as we mentioned, China and Russia are coming in on board. They want to make a play uh, on the global health stage. But it was so interesting meeting that uh, Lisa and I were in Geneva. You could just see the whole world falling back into its old kind of house. So you had like Oxford and the NIH bumping up against each other, right? Different intellectual cultures. Who's going to be first? So, you know, I don't know how you do that. But I think, again, not pretending that it isn't happening. Saying that perhaps this is uh, deleterious to uh, good outbreak management. Um, that's what I think we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been fascinating. All of the statisticians uh, and, and methodologists who have had a field day with this because they've been debating the relative merits of you know, a Bayesian versus a non-Bayesian approach or a, you know, an adaptive versus a non-adaptive design. So uh, the, the answer to this question is very simply, uh, those, if it shows a fact, you know, the placebo group are defined, we should be offered vaccination. Yeah. And the first question about frameworks going forward, I think we really need, so there's a group 
group of us that really want to work on a more, so we defaulted to compassionate use as the justification, and I tried to argue against that from the beginning, and because I don't think it fits, because you can't compassionately use something that's only been used in 16 back movies, right? You only have phase one safety and not data. The other thing is, uh, it's hard to talk about you know, compassionate pre-exposure prophylaxis when you've got simple to the last thing. So we need, uh, we've been using this monitored emergency use of unregistered investigational agents, which is a bit of a mouthful. But there's a group of us that are trying to come up with a new framework to address this very issue because it's going to happen again and again. And we want to differentiate ourselves from the right to try group that's trying to undermine the uh, uh, FDA side of the border. And so monitored emergency use is a really fascinating new concept that, that emerged from these meetings, but we have no governance structure and certainly no ethics model framework to monitor that. So we have to come up with that. I think that that's a really good thing to work on. I'm doing a double take on my yeah. area doing placebo, but anyway. Um, <laughs> that's because it's under the FDA agents in the US, right? It's been very okay. clear and unequivocal from the start. I was wondering if, since there are so many different Thank you.